to be here to be able to say a few words about Brias. I will try to do this within the limits of time and I try to find out where the arrow is. Yes, here. OK, so I will shortly talk uh, about uh, Brias and Brussels, which was asked to me. I will say a little bit about the models we used in order to define Brias. I will say a few words about Institutes for Advanced Study in the world, Europe and in Belgium, and then speak more specifically about Brias, about the future location. And I will end with something which is a link between my profession, which was medical physics and image processing, and mainly in nuclear medicine, and the field here about upcycling of food. OK, it's, it's a real pleasure for to be here in this room for those who are present, which is the Solvay room, because the Solvay conferences were really among, I would say, the basic ideas that uh, allowed us to develop the concept of uh, Brias. Uh, the, the very first conference, Solvay conference, was held in 1911, uh, invited by a, by a chemist, uh, uh, Ernest Solvay, and he invited uh, some 20 of the most brilliant scientists at that point. Um, you see, um, I don't know whether this arrow works. Yeah, here you have Einstein, uh, you have Marie Curie, uh, you have uh, here Marie Curie, uh, you have um, Poincaré, Lawrence, etc. Um, and they discussed for a while from different disciplines on the concept of radiation and quanta. And it really completely revolutionized the um, theories at that point and physics in general. It was repeated many times. It's still being repeated. In fact, I just saw there the 2019th yearbook of the Solvay conferences. But a very important one was the fifth one uh, in which you once again see Einstein. And he didn't agree with Bohr about the uncertainty principle by Heisenberg. Uh, and that's when Einstein said, God doesn't play dice. And Bohr replied, Einstein, stop telling God what to do. OK. <laughs> second source of inspiration was the Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies, which was created in 1930, just after the BRIC uh, economic crisis, when uh, three people of Jewish origin, because Jewish people had a difficult time at that uh, moment, uh, said we want to create something, uh, which is an institute which will be a haven for scholars and scientists, we will not be afraid of any issue and there will be no pressure. You will have complete freedom to work uh, on what you want. And we will assure you that you have facilities with tranquility and you will have plenty of time to work. And those th elements together made, again, changes in science in general. You see one very famous uh, person there, Albert Einstein. This is a statue in the Hahn. The Hahn is a small, uh, very nice town at the seaside of Belgium where he lived for a while before moving to the US. And we had uh, at least uh, two um, mathematicians who stayed in Princeton. Uh, Pierre Deligne is still staying there, I think, uh, and Jean Bourguin, one from ULB, one from VUB. OK, what are the lessons we learned? First of all, invite brilliant scientists from different disciplines, important different disciplines around the common team. Give them for enough time an environment which is free of daily hassles so that they really can be creative. Let them present their work at seminars, but especially let them discuss afterwards in complete freedom so that they can tell anyone here without being afraid of being hurt. Uh, this is why we don't record the um, discussions that uh, you are completely wrong. 
uh, and this is an excellent idea, etc. So complete freedom and let them disagree, let them dream, let them have coffee together, invent things, etc. And normally you will have excellent results coming out of this. And this is what we aim with BRIAS. This is a map of the Institute of Advanced Studies in the world. You see there is a high concentration in Europe. Uh, there is there's some, some, but very little of them in the southern part of our world. Uh, and in Belgium, there are two. We were created, founded, created, I don't know how to, which is the correct word, in 2018 and started our activities last year. And in Leuven now, they also created an institute uh, last November. Why Brussels? Well, those of you who have never been to Brussels, Brussels is really a patchwork of different social, economic and cultural environments. And as a capital of, as capital of Europe, we are home to 180 different nationalities and more than 100 different languages are being spoken. So it's extremely pluricultural. It has an incredibly rich political, cultural and scientific history. Just to, to name a few, we all know the Emperor Charles V. He was born in Ghent, my hometown, uh, but spent most of his childhood here in Brussels. And he was educated in Mechelen, which is 20 kilometers from, from here. Um, this is also the place, Brussels, where he abdicated uh, as emperor. Um, this was that happened in the Aula Magna of the Koudenberg Palace, which was built by the Dukes of Burgundy. I will say a word about this later. Some of you have been to the museum and have seen paintings by Rogier van der Weyden, by Bruegel. Uh, you all know Vesalius, the anatomy of the human body, uh, Erasmus, etc. They all worked or lived here in Brussels. Now I'll jump a few centuries, and in 1834, this university was created. Um, there was another university recreated the very same year, which was the Catholic University of Leuven. The, the aim of the Catholic University was to spread the Catholic belief and knowledge, etc. This university was created to, uh, uh, I would say, um, advance science and knowledge away from any taboos. OK, this is uh, what is written there. And then there was gradually a Flemish speaking section which was being developed at the university and because of uh, political reasons, the two were split in 70 and in 2018 Brias was created. This is a very short history about why it's for us important that all of this happened in Brussels. I told you about the Koudenberg Palace. I show this because this palace doesn't exist anymore, of course. It was built around 1460 and in 1731 it burned down. Nearly at the site of the current royal palace, and for those who know Brussels, the Place Royale, uh, Rue Royale, etc. You can still visit the part of this. This is the right the slide on the right, uh, the, the image on the right side of the slide. And it's for those among you who are interested in world history, it's really worth visiting this and knowing that Charles V actually walked and played there. OK. As I said, Brussels is a patchwork of different socio-economic and cultural environments. Um, I just put the wrong button, sorry. What is the mission and what is the goal or goal of BRIAS? It's first to promote advancement of science through inter and transdisciplinary research. It's to cross boundaries and build bridges between disciplines so that you have ideas, but also to build bridges between different socio-economic and cultural environments. It's to progress uh, towards a sustainable world, the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. It's to stimulate collaborations 
between the universities, between the universities and your home institutions, and then to build a, cre a community of researchers around all this and to have sustainable collaborations and projects, etc., which uh, will develop. And of course, it's also a aim to help the, uh, add to the prestige of the Brussels region and zone. There are a few specificities to BRIAS as compared to other institutes of advanced studies. First of all, and this is, I would say, the DNA of the two universities, we are not afraid at all of, conver of controversial subjects, uh, especially when they have an important social impact. Uh, we are extremely um, sensible, sensitive uh, to uh, researchers from countries uh, where they may be in danger. I remember three years ago we had a situation in Turkey where so many scientists were uh, either imprisoned or uh, had to leave, etc. Um, and we really want to emphasize collaborations uh, with institutions in countries, mainly in the southern part of the world, uh, which face critical challenges with respect to sustainability. The future location, now you're housed in Adagio, but there are uh, former barracks which are being completely renovated just across the campus of uh, ULB and VUB. Um, the the um, barracks are being renovated. That's where uh, the fellows will live. That's where they will work and in the labs of the university, of course, also. And the architectural plan is such that really it's optimized for contacts, okay? Um, there will, the renovation has started, so they are actually uh, building and uh, renovating now, should be ready in 2024, and there will be something like uh, 19 uh, apartments or uh, studios present there. So you know where you know, the future uh, fellows will be able to live and work. Now, uh, as I said, I want to add a, just a personal historical note, uh, which I hope will be of interest to you, because it's a link between foot upcycling and nuclear medicine. And um, in 1923, a Hungarian scientist, George Havesey, introduced the tracer aspect, the use of radioactive elements in very tiny um, quantities uh, to study metabolism. And he did this for plant uh, roots. Okay, so he uh, put, I think it was uh, lead 212 uh, in uh, water, put plants in it, and then he checked how the radioactivity came in the roots, to the stem, to the leaves, etc. The pictures have nothing to do with his research because, of course, he didn't make pictures at that time. He had to, to do this. He, he got the Nobel Prize for inventing the tracer concept. Okay, so it's, it's a smart guy. But the interesting thing is the following. That is, in 1911, he was studying in Manchester and he was staying in a boarding house with a landlady where they had their meals in the evening. And he suspected that she was recycling the meals. Not only what was left in the pot, but also what was left on the plate. Because when they had carrots, the day afterwards they had carrot soup and maybe uh, carrot mashed potatoes with carrots, etc. So what he did is he sprinkled a little bit of lead 212 on his plate. <laughs> the day afterwards, he measured the radioactivity in the foot and he said to his landlady, look, I know you recycle what is left over on our plates. I have the proof. And the this very same day he was expelled from the boarding <laughs> where he was staying. So this is the link between, I would say, nuclear medicine, upcycling of foot. And with this, I thank you 
and I leave again the floor to you. set up over here. Just a moment, please. Okay. Oops, my drop sheets. Here we go. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank, for this wonderful introduction uh, on Brias and also for that uh, fantastic anecdote about upcycling in the past. It's not one that you, you hear every day. So really, thank you for that that story. I think that's going to uh, stay with us <laughs> all evening, <laughs> especially at dinner time when we're thinking about what, what's on our plate. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, in tonight's forum, as, as Frank uh, introduced for us already, we will be focusing our attention on the topic of food innovation, which is a very important uh, topic with great potential to help us tackle some of, uh, some of the great environmental and societal challenges of our time. Oh, I suppose I can remove my mask. <laughs> our speakers tonight will be dealing with the topics of preventing food loss in the global uh, supply chain and countering food waste by tackling circular approaches and through upcycling food waste to make new products. Our next speaker is Dr. Adam Pressler, who is the Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of Hazel Technologies, Inc. He is responsible for innovation, research and development for Hazel's product lines, and he invented the core technologies leading to the Hazel 100 1MCP product line. Adam leads the Hazel team to investigate and refine new ways of using biomolecular compounds to extend shelf life, quality, and durability of fruits and vegetables throughout the supply chain. Adam holds a PhD in chemistry from Northwest. Northwestern University in the United States and now resides in London. And now without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Adam Pressler. I just move the mouse around like that and yeah. previous and next on the and keyboard. Just, uh, just with the arrows. Around. Okay. Back and, and the mic is. It's, it's just in the I'm computer. Into the yeah. computer. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Annette, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be here presenting to you today, and I really appreciate being invited to chat about something I'm really passionate about, uh, which is extending the quality of fruits and vegetables in the supply chain. Um, maybe a, just a word about Hazel before I jump in. Um, we are based out of Chicago. We are um, a kind of see ourselves an agricultural technology company. Um, we have operations throughout mostly the United States, but also a fair share of Latin America, focus a lot on uh, specialty crops and work with the largest growers and shippers um, in that part of the food system. So uh, I like to start off just talking about food waste and the challenge that it represents. Um, you know, as with any complex issue, there's a lot of different variables that play into um, the impacts of food waste in our economy and our ecology. Um, really at a high level, if you eat a strawberry, that strawberry represents a tremendous amount of resources um, and effort of both human capital, uh, and water and fertilizer and CO2 and all of the above. If you wanna break that down and think about each of those components, I have some base calculations on this slide, uh, just to give you an idea, but there can really be no doubt that food waste as a challenge to our economy and our ecology uh, represents one of the best opportunities to reduce the impact that we have on the planet. Supply chain waste itself is something I think we all intuit is large and substantial. 
but just kind of starting from the, the highest level, we think about, say, raspberries or strawberries, very, very perishable items, um, can easily see wastage in the 20 to 40% regime. I'm, I'm talking there about complete spoilage. Um, there's also loss in the economic sense where growers have their uh, shipments downgraded in terms of quality, which represents still a greater loss uh, to them out of pocket. I think it's good to focus on the, the loss side because we understand what we're trying to save, but I also kind of like to view things in a sort of an optimistic forward way as well. What can we do in innovating on food waste to improve the lives of people? Um, if you think about sort of demographic trends over the next few years, um, we anticipate that human lifespan will continue to increase. We anticipate the global middle class will continue to expand. Uh, and all this time, I think it's important that, you know, those people who are entering the middle class, those people across the whole world, regardless of where they are economically, they should be eating well and they should be living well. Uh, and when we think about how we want to eat in the next 20 or 30 or 40 years, I would posit that we should be thinking about fruit and vegetable really at the top of the consideration. Uh, because as we know, one of the sort of few truisms uh, in nutritional science, you want to eat enough fruit and vegetables. That's highly associated with an increase in lifespan. In uh, one study out of Sweden, it increased the average lifespan of produce eaters by 2.7 years. Um, it's a really impactful way to improve the quality of life of people, which I think is what we're trying to do. So plants are not dead. They are very much alive. And even the avocado uh, in the in the reefer container or on the ship is very much alive. And it is respiring. It is doing biochemistry. Uh, it is very much living. Plants also don't have the benefit of being able to speak or move around or give visual cues uh, that mean anything to each other. So they often communicate by creative methods. And one of those most notable methods, I think, is the delivery of volatile uh, active compounds. So ethylene is a really common one that's mentioned. Um, it's, you know, probably we're all quite familiar with the effect ethylene has in terms of a stress response in plants and driving ripening, but there are a great host of other molecules that indicate, indicate things like herbivory uh, or growth or otherwise provide signaling in the environment. And this kind of approach has really inspired Hazel. So we like to think of our products as existing in the ecosystem with the fruit if it's on the ship, if it's on the truck, uh, and basically listening in on and maybe signaling in this particular orchestra that's being played across uh, the fruits and vegetables in that space. So our flagship technology, um, well, I guess I should say, taking a step before I get into that, um, what that means for actually producing a product. So I, I told you about the importance of communication in plant tissues and, and how plants like to use volatiles uh, to communicate. Um, but the way that really translates to products and being able to increase the shelf life, uh, we think about things in the, in the perspective of the chemistry. So when we look out there into the world and space and we think about what kind of active ingredients we want to use and how we want to deploy them, we make sure that we're focusing on the highest bar for environmental and human safety. We look to make sure that we're only using actives that are, in the US, they'd be residue exempt. In other codec countries, uh, they would have sort of arbitrary maximum residue limits, basically minimum residue, right? We don't want any residue. Uh, and because of this emphasis, we tend to look at actives which are growth regulators rather than necessarily having a, um, what's called a lethal mode of action. So you commonly think of a pesticide, you think of something that kills a fungus. This is more about modifying the way that fungus would grow. So the, the core product that we have uh, is really focused around an active ingredient called 1-methylcyclopropene. It's a synthetic compound, um, but it is one with a fantastic uh, safety profile. It's deployed at parts per billion concentrations. Um, you know, I've been in Apple rooms in Washington State in the US where you might have two and a half million kilos of apples. And we talk about doing applications of five or six grams of this active. It's a phenomenal potency. Um, it works by inhibiting the action of ethylene receptors in the plant tissue. So binding the copper center, that's, uh, we think about that specifically ETR1 crystal structure from Arabidopsis. This is, that's that sort of binding event where excluding ethylene from that binding event. And what that does is it prevents the fruit for a time, at least until those proteins turn over. It prevents the fruit for a time from being able to see 
ethylene and respond to it. So, you know, here it is in situ, one of our little sachets there, you know, delivering one MCP in a controlled manner um, where you know, the kinetics of that release are an important part of the equation. Uh, this is a set of green skin avocados. This is a commonly grown in Latin America. This is not your typical Hass avocado, uh, which, which you know, we would associate with guacamole. Um, using the application of the sachet, we're able to ex extend the shelf life for nine to 10 days. This is a really big deal because this particular grower is operating in Homestead, Florida. That's the southern tip of Florida. And they are growing this fruit and they know they have, oh, I don't know, 11 days to get it somewhere. Um, and so it's a big, big push with them. You know, they're really limited in the markets they can go to and the folks that can enjoy their produce because of that. And we're adding the ability to extend the shelf life 50 percent, 100 percent and thus their market. So they are quite happy with that. And so, too, are the avocados. So that was uh, a green skin avocado or alternatively a tropical avocado. Hass is the most popular avocado variety. And um, we've worked with the largest uh, Hass exporters in the world and still do. Um, and we're able to extend the shelf life of that fruit uh, as well. Here showing kind of a supply chain situation where the fruit is being held at 44 Fahrenheit. I apologize. <laughs> 44 Fahrenheit to what's that like like six Celsius um, and then to retail conditions at ambient so 20 Celsius uh, and in both conditions both under the, the pressure of elevated temperature and also in su standard supply chain we're able to extend the shelf life. Um, here is measured by firmness. Sure is a, it's a material science measurement where you look at the force required to obtain a certain level of deformity. So it's the, the basically the probe is deforming the fruit flesh by a known distance and then measuring that, that necessary force. Um, another really, I think, colorful uh, model system for this kind of technology is the pear and particularly the Bartlett or alternatively the Williams pear. This pear changes color as it ripens, so it provides a really nice um, pop sort of to the image that you can observe. So it'll go from green as it's hard to yellow and then, you know, to mush eventually as it ripens. Uh, application of the technology is able to extend the shelf life and also maintain the optimum eating quality window. People tend to like that. Um, firmness is measured in pounds here, but people tend to like that three and a half to, to four and a half pound eating quality. That's going to associate with enough firmness that you can actually hold the fruit and, and you know, move it around while still giving you that nice sweetness that we all associate with uh, the Williams pear. So this technology can be sized at lots of different levels. We are, I think, most often applying this at the case level of some 10 kilos of fruit or less, uh, but also we have SKUs which we can deploy in with apples in long-term storage in bins where you might be holding something like 300 kilos in each bin. Um, and so this is sort of two different applications situations. One is left to here is really supply chain and the right is more about um, farmers storing fruits for extended periods of time. We've, we've found that people really like the long term storage side uh, of the technology, when, especially when they're a little bit smaller operation. So the big scale operations will tend to use fumigation methods where it's a sort of a single application to sort of turn the fruits ethylene sensitivity off. Uh, but for the smaller players where they have just a few hundred bins, this kind of direct application is, is very clean operationally and they prefer it. So in the US, that would be pretty much everybody outside of the, the Pacific Northwest. So I, I gave you the overview here that we're looking at creating signaling molecules. We're looking at you know being involved in that natural communication that the fruit is already having with the 1MCP technology. We, of course, have other technologies that are at various stages of development. I highlight these two other opportunities. Uh, one we call Hazel Endure. This is an organic compatible antimicrobial that takes makes use of certain um, essential oils that we have established are good for this volatile application. This will be first deployed in grapes this season in the United States. Um, just to kind of talk about how that works, uh, we have a, again an insert that goes into the packaging and releases a, a naturally occurring active that inhibits both the germination and um, you know, growth of botrytis and other fungal species. And the anti-sprouting side, this is actually, so 
actually very, very interesting. I'm going to get a little animated here, guys. Hold on. Um, so the, the potato side is very much a dynamic uh, post-harvest situation in Europe. So the most commonly used active ingredient that prevents sprouting in potatoes has just been taken off the market completely. And potato sprouting and the subsequent throwing away of potatoes is actually a really major food waste issue. The potato is the fourth largest crop in the world by total calorie production. And it is also one of the most thrown away things. Uh, you might not necessarily totally connect with that because we usually think of potatoes as a pretty durable good, but especially this time of year after they've had their long-term winter storage period end, they tend to get very sprouty. So you're, if you took a potato home from the grocery store, it should probably just take a short amount of time to sprout as compared to like December. And the main reason, the purpose of this slide is the main reason people throw potatoes out is sprouting. Yes, they can putrefy, you know, yes, you might see some weird spots, but most of the time consumers are saying, hey, it sprouted, I'll throw it out, or I see the beginnings of peeping on the eyes of the potato. I'm not going to buy this one at the grocery store. So we've approached this, um, you know, seeing that need and also understanding that CIPC, which is the world standard in sprout reduction, is now illegal in the EU and may eventually go the same way in the rest of the world, um, that there was an opportunity here to help the farmer and the consumer to have longer lasting potatoes. So we developed, uh, again, based on organic uh, actives, this can be registered as organic and will be in the US uh, first. Um, again, we're delivering an active volatile. Again, this is a signaling molecule that tells the potato, hold on, stay dormant a little bit longer. Uh, and as a result, we're able to extend the shelf life pot of potatoes uh, dramatically. I also like the volatile application method above sprays because it can be done at any time in the supply chain and tends to provide a homogeneous application rather than a spray, which is necessarily going to be kind of pocketed. So here's just some examples in play, organic red and russet potatoes. Uh, these, were, I think these were out of Wisconsin. Um, large cases applied with the technology and we're able to suppress that uh, under aggressive ambient storage conditions are able to suppress that uh, sprouting very thoroughly. Um, this is my favorite shot. These are organic fingerling potatoes. So this is a high value commodity. So you're used to sort of russets. Those are sort of low value per pound potatoes. These are organic fingerlings. So their price looks more like fruit. The resources it takes actually grow this and ship it is more like something like a strawberry than it is like uh, a russet. And we're able to suppress extremely well uh, the sprouting in these potatoes, despite the fact they tend to also have some of the worst shelf life uh, of what's out there. So hopefully with this technology in the market and you know being deployed across the world, we'll all get to taste much more interesting types of potatoes. Um, you know, I think appropriate for the land of, uh, you know, is it okay for me to call them French fries here? I think, is, it, is that allowed? <laughs> yes. Uh, so um, yeah, that's that's the, the the sort of piece there. I mean, we're, we're a, I think it's been a really wild ride. We started Hazel back in 2015 with five of us. Uh, we're now a little bit over 75 people uh, across the US and we project that we'll treat something like 2.5 billion kilos of produce this year. And that, that would correspond to about 200 million kilos um, in produce that is not thrown away or downgraded as a result of our treatment. So that level of application, I think, is one reason I really like getting up in the morning and, and getting to work. Um, so with that, I'll sign off, hand off to whoever's next, and happy to take questions. Uh, I was just curious, like, uh, what's the capacity? You can, you can yell out, and I'll just, I'll restate. Uh, what's the capacity uh, it could spread uh, for one packet of this? Oh yeah, so that that varies. So the the recommended dose rate varies crop to crop, as you might expect, a lot. In the same way that ethylene sensitivity varies crop to crop by a lot. So, for example, the most ethylene sensitive crop would be green bananas, unripened bananas, 
where you can expect that the banana will stop ripening basically at about two or three parts per billion on MCP. Uh, other end of the spectrum would be something like a passion fruit, which has, I think, the highest ethylene production per kilogram of any fruit. And, you know, several hundred parts per billion or even parts per million are necessary to see a noticeable increase in shelf life. So we, we take that into account whenever we develop the skew for that particular crop. And that's part of our guidance to the grower. So it's very individualistic to different groups. Yeah, we have to we have to do sort of careful per commodity guidance on the dosing um, just to get the best for the grower. Hopefully folks take some potatoes home from the grocery store and see if I'm right about sprouting. Hello. Um, I'd like to take one question from the chat um, uh, from Professor Mark Arts. Uh, I grow potatoes myself and have not yet come across a suitable replacement for the uh, of the former chemical anti-sprouting agent. Yeah. Is hazel root for sale already in Europe? <laughs> Um, not, not yet, though I, I do appreciate the excitement and that's, that's the kind of thing that I like to hear. Um, I, it's, it's not necessarily certain yet whether it'll come out in the US or EU first. Um, there's, there's a possibility it'll come out in the EU first, um, but it'll still be a few years. We, we do have to go through some regulatory processes here first, but I, I really do appreciate the enthusiasm. So I got a softball and then a, a tough question. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, the, the easy one here is, uh, so your background um, was in science, but then you yeah. this company at Northwestern. So yeah. was this your, the technology you developed or are those two things disconnected? So um, somewhat comically, my PhD was in magnetic resonance imaging, and now I am doing food stuff. So I feel like there's a theme in presentations. Okay. Um, so I guess my tougher question is, uh, you know, a lot of consumers are turned off by fruit, uh, mm. both by the breeders. I mean, if you look at what breeders select watermelons for, taste is very last mm -hmm. after a lot of other things. And the agronomy, uh, you know, they're harvesting crops earlier than ever. And so there's less nutrients and minerals, less flavor. So to what extent do you think you're sort of exacerbating that issue of, mm. you know, decreasing the quality and taste of food and turning consumers off fruit by this, by allowing farmers to harvest it earlier? Interesting. I, so I, I would say just talking about the actives that we um, use first and our approach to sort of the sensory outcomes, um, we're, we're quite careful in making sure that anything that we do in the supply chain, whether it's handling or a new product, um, is not affecting the sensory experience for the consumer. That's a, that's a major part. So literally, I think right now we've got an ongoing taste trial with one of the products that I showed we're doing um, a 400 person panel in Oregon and we're just basically going through and looking okay after this much storage period what's the sensory experience what's the sensory experience what's the sensory experience and, and that's a really important part of what we do uh, in terms of in terms of grower or breeder behavior um, and how improved shelf life technologies may affect that I think it's an interesting question um, for, for shelf life in a lot of commodities, I think it varies. So it, you, you'll have examples like melons where there's definitely a history of developing shipper. They literally, they'll say like Western shipper melons and that's just about getting it over to Asia. But I think there is a push more and more for things like in grapes or moving to much more tasty varieties. Um, so I'd say, I'd say the two are somewhat decoupled um, in that respect. Um, but you know, ultimately the grower I think is going to pick how they push their season to the extremes uh, as a result of sort of the economics of what they're doing. And what I hope that we can do, certainly my design, is to extend the shelf life of their best, highest quality, highest price crop as well. So I think avocados are a good example um, where in the early season for a given field, you're going to have a low dry matter avocado, which is generally associated with lower price and less quality. Same field some months later in your next harvest, you're going to have a higher dry matter. Those are creamier and more guacamole friendly, right? And that actually is the fruit that we target because it is most in need of shelf life extension. Um, so hopefully more guacamole. Um, I have one uh, question, uh, comment and question from the chat. Um, from Mary Louise Skippo from Niche. She says, very interesting, thank you. Uh, what do you know about the possible toxicity of your active compounds? Great, 
Great, great, great. So the so one MCP um, as an active uh, has been around for about 20 years. So it's, there's really, really good um, use case data on it. Um, it is, you know, I, there's actually guidance and regulation when you work in this industry where you're not supposed to say something is safe. I mean, literally, I can't sit up here and say water is safe. Um, <laughs> and it's sort of the regulatory guidance that exists. But um, MCP is as as innocuous as I can imagine an active ingredient being. Um, you know, we, again, we use it at levels which are parts per billion. Um, residues are not detectable, which is a requirement of any technology that we look at. Um, and even in, if you were to kind of create an arbitrary high dose case, um, I mean, the, the profile looks a lot like ethylene uh, in terms of in terms of exposure. So it's about as it's about as good as something can be. Uh, in terms of the other actives, yeah, we we, we pull those from um, naturally occurring sources. Um, where possible, we make sure that we're using food grade materials. Uh, so those are also very much on the on the end of the spectrum of being as safe as they can be. Uh, we'll take one uh, final question from the chat and then move to the next speaker. Uh, this is again from uh, Black Arts from Wahoo. Uh, the first transgen uh, transgenic plant on the market was the Flavor Saver in the yeah. early 90s, which was affected in ethylene signaling. It mm -hmm. was not a success. He nope. called it a Frankenstein food. But with uh, CRISPR CAS options coming up, uh, would there still be a chance for these modified crops, or would you favor the hazel technologies? Well, I'll always favor the hazel technologies. Um, I think that's that's for certain. Um, and I and I wouldn't, um, you know, I'm all about innovation in all aspects of the different technologies that can interface with what we do. Um, I think that ultimately, you know, the the breeding side. I hope that folks are, you know, focusing on the best eating experience, best value experience for for each stakeholder in the supply chain. And I think that we, it's incumbent on us as folks who work in extending shelf life in the supply chain to build solutions for that process. Um, so I definitely see us as serving um, the, the consumer, but also the grower and the people along the way. Um, did I answer the question? I think that might have, hopefully that, hopefully that did. <laughs> do, you, do you favor uh, hazel technologies over new developed products? Yeah, I, I, th I think that I, I think that we're, you know, we're part of a broad ecosystem of food and it's important for there to be development across all types of technologies. Um, and I'd like us to be involved in a broad spectrum of technologies. Thank you, Adam. Thank you very much. So what, what kind of molecule is the one MCP? Sorry? What kind of molecule is that one MCP? It's a it's a it's a it's a olefin, so yeah. it's a C4 okay. poly uh, cyclopropene. Okay. So it's yeah, it's it's you know, molecular weights like 54 something like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So from fruit and veggie, we move to the, the bread world. Our next speaker is uh, Frédéric de Bast. So he has uh, an academic profile. He's an uh, assistant professor here at ULB. So he got uh, um, his uh, degree in chemical and engineering in 2004. Then he did a PhD on uh, drying yeast. In 2009, he stayed in Wageningen University. So we say hello to uh, Mark and Yehun. I've seen that they're online. Um, so he's working at the transfer interfaces and processes uh, service, you say in English, <laughs> uh, at ULB on the, the Solbosch campus. Um, he's a uh, vice president of the bioengineering school at ULB and he's teaching, he has quite a, a lot of uh, teaching activity, important teaching activity. So on fluid mechanics and transfer processes, design of chemical plants, chemical and biological reaction design. So 
Frederick is keeping quite uh, busy with this teaching, and uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, uh, invite him for the second time in the, the Brias uh, events. So we were calculating who uh, was who would win the contest. So we have uh, set he did already two presentations. Mark did three, and Antonella did three. So it's a tie between you and, and Seth. Ah, also four. four. The winner. <laughs> so the, the floor is uh, is yours. Yes, thank you. As I'm always upcycling the same presentation, I'm not sure I will be able to go with further than two. But uh, uh, so thank you very much for the for the, uh, the kind introduction. So uh, uh, today I want to speak about uh, bread uh, as a as a waste and undesirable waste. So as uh, uh, Christian mentioned I've been working on uh, on drying in my PhD and since then I've been drying everything that is, can be dried in uh, as food but other, also as other products so cocoa, pepper, many really nice uh, food including bread. And why do I want to speak about bread? Well in fact uh, my introduction can uh, be uh, globally is globally uh, online with what just said uh, the previous speakers he already is my talk quite a lot because I wanted to go first on global waste uh, I have different numbers because I have uh, different methodologies and based on the worldwide uh, elements and we can see huge amount of waste in mass in uh, emitted uh, CO2 but also and really importantly uh, on the, uh, the amount of energy that is available when you eat it because we a lot uh, look about uh, uh, about uh, vegetables and fruits and I think it's really important but most of them are um, uh, a lot of water and not that much energy the first thing we need uh, in fact energy and again the previous speakers uh, insisted on the importance in potatoes uh, that it was a huge waste in terms of calories the same is for cereals and one of the uh, major source of cereals we have in our food is bread if you look for example here you have uh, quite old data but the principle is still the same if you look at the cereals in weight of the loss they are about 20 percent but if you look at what you're wasting in terms of a calories it's 53 uh, percent so in terms of loss for food intake uh, it's really uh, uh, important so that should be really um, in phase uh, uh, in, in phase so of course it's not the same everywhere I always want to insist on that uh, and uh, here you have a distribution uh, in uh, uh, all around the world and we can see that of course you have uh, waste all along the, the, the production chain and the supply chain from the, the production to uh, the, the consumer and we can see that in Europe typically uh, consumer combined with distribution are not that negligible so already on that part there are many things that can be uh, considered and that can be done and so just a word about Belgium because we are in Belgium uh, and unfortunately we cannot be really proud of us uh, on this field uh, at European scale because we are one of the largest food uh, uh, waster of Europe uh, if not uh, the, the largest after the Netherlands so of course those uh, numbers have to be taken carefully depend on the methodology and have to consider also the, 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 the fact that uh, it's the total amount wasted on the territory and that we are globally producing more than we are eating we are a global net food exporter so that means also that we have uh, we are wasting more at that uh, on that part still there is nothing to be really uh, proud uh, uh, there so in Belgium you will also even have big numbers for Brussels uh, in 2014 at that time most of it was uh, incinerated uh, which is not uh, really uh, the, the best option nowadays fortunately we are moving away from uh, that incineration of food progressively so we are um, indeed progressing but then on bread specifically if we look at it uh, we find less numbers but we can see that for a part of Belgium which is Flanders where we have quite good data we see that in total we are wasting one fourth of the total bread that we are pr producing that number is somehow confirmed by other studies like in Sweden uh, where there are quite advanced uh, studies on, on waste in, in supermarkets typically where they have 30 percent of the uh, 
waste from supermarkets that are uh, uh, bred. So targeting that bread just on those level, not getting uh, too uh, early in uh, uh, in the production stage, just by the retailing and the distri uh, distribution and uh, the con con consumption can be uh, an important uh, an important goal. Here you can see globally the estimated loss where it would be. Most of it is of the consumer, so there we can think what can we do. Unfortunately, not much, except if we consider some uh, ideas of recycling them the next day. But uh, not sure it's uh, it's necessarily uh, th that good idea uh, beyond a certain point, even if uh, maybe. Um, so that's I would say the technical reason I would point in order to uh, go and, um, and and have a specific look at bread, but we can also be a little bit more general and think at, at the place that bread uh, historically takes uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in humanity. Bread is one of the oldest uh, transformed food that we have. Processing food began nearly with uh, bread, which is one of the oldest, and it has taken a huge part in uh, human history. If you think about Eucharistia, food there is bread. If you think about one of the main reasons of the French Revolution, it was that the people didn't have bread anymore. It was a symbol for wheat and for cereals in general, but that's really a big symbol. So we fought for that and nowadays we are wasting a lot of it. So maybe we can try to see what we can do on it. And to do that, I would like to shortly come back to what is bread. It can seem obvious, but to see what we are able to do with bread and what we could do uh, means uh, requires to, to have a short look at it. So, of course, bread is water, flour, and some yeast in order to ferment uh, and have uh, some rising. Uh, and so, I won't enter into details of yeast anyway, I wouldn't be able to do so. Uh, water, that's quite clear, but the key element in between is flour. Flour is mainly starch and gluten. The starch is our source of energy, it's long chain of, uh, I, um, uh, of sugars that we are able uh, to um, digest progressively in order to slowly have our uh, energy. That's really a key of our uh, uh, energy supply and in um, in flour, like in uh, many other cereals, it's uh, um, it's organized in long chain that are sometimes branched and all those chains will in fact form long uh, chains like you see this here that will auto organize themselves in different regions. In some region, they will be highly crystalline, so all the chain will align in order to get a quite dense structure in another situation, typically where you have branchings, you will see something that will be amorphous. So you will see regions that are crystalline, regions that are amorphous, that will uh, do uh, um, all the grains, and you will get at the end those kind of grains that are in, uh, in, in principle, uh, successive crystalline and amorphous region. Crystalline dense structure are difficult to, um, uh, well, really difficult to digest and uh, make the, uh, the, 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 the starch less available. This is important because when you add water to starch, it will get that water and it will uh, globally uh, rise, you will have hydrogen bound that will give you a larger structure. But if you remove the water again, it will allow the structure to rearrange and maybe to be more crystalline. That means that when you do mix that starch with water and then you remove it again, you will, you will not see the same product, even if you're not cooking. On top of that, we have gluten in the system, which is a complex system of uh, proteins. So, uh, mostly two types of protein that are uh, here. It's not, uh, it's not that important uh, to, to see the details for, for, for this talk, but we can remember that this is uh, one of the key elements. Indeed, when we do bread, we mix everything. We, uh, um, and, and when we add water, the gluten and the starch will trap the water and we are forming our dough. 
that will then ferment, we will produce CO2 and give, keep some of the CO2 and other key molecules for uh, the aromas into the, uh, into the dough. Then when we'll cook by heat transfer, we will probably progressively evaporate water and begins to have reaction. The main reaction we have is the Maillard reaction. It is a long set and complex set of reaction that will have a reaction between the uh, sugar we have and the amines of the protein. That means that if you take not the sugar, but the long chains of sugar that we have there, you will form a complex network of gluten and um, those sugars. All that means that progressively you are losing some uh, interesting elements, some of the sugar and some of the proteins that are not available anymore for uh, um, uh, for your food intake. You have something that is more complicated and less nutritious somehow. Up to a certain point, that's a good news that creates your network that will create your nice bread. But if you go too far, you will see too much reaction, loss of nutritional value, and globally more and more unwanted product arriving. If you overcook, you all know you finish with something that is totally burned with calcium carcinogenic elements and so on. And so you have to be uh, careful in that um, in that cooking. So that means that the cooking is a key element. We want to cook the bread, otherwise we don't have all the flavors we want. We don't have the structure we want. We don't have the bread we want. But uh, that also means that once it's cooked, you cannot go necessarily easily further. Some other products, uh, we've been a little bit speaking about chocolates. In fact, you might recycle them as much as you want. As long as it's ch chocolate, it's possible to uh, uh, melt them, uh, place them again in chocolates uh, or um, uh, do new forms. It's totally possible to recycle a lot uh, uh, in the field. In bread, because of that cooking, it's more difficult. And as I've mentioned, once your bread loses its water, it's it's again less digestible and so uh, you can try to work on that but not uh, all as much as you want. You all know that you can toast uh, bread in order to give it again some moisture and uh, some extra flavor but you won't toast it five times in a row. That time you won't have something it will be overcooked but also nearly not digestible at all. So when we say okay let's have a look at what we can do on bread we have to take that into account. So if we think now we know what's bread, how can we valorize it? And there for that, I will come back with a classical approach, which is the movement ladder applied to food. So in order to say, what should I do first? And of course, even if I'm an engineer and I'm interested in transforming, I have a first point that is the most important one is prevent. Try not to produce too much, try to uh, eat everything that is uh, uh, as possible. And if not, let's try it to consume it as food or as a food part without having to transform it too much. So again, not necessarily just as bread, but we said toast or uh, any derived product that might contain unwanted bread. We tend to forget that, but uh, uh, our grandparents had many way of using uh, wasted what we you know what they call uh, wasted bread in order to still uh, consume it. Then again, we might say, okay, if that's not possible, we can you can process it uh, again to do some new food, and that's more what I'm interested in. Or use it as animal feed, use it as a raw material. So that's a general, uh, I would say, uh, scope for uh, for food and using it for uh, new raw materials in non-food application. I don't know any application for bread, but maybe there is some, uh, but but I don't know that. And then we can say, OK, if that's not possible, we can still go for other uh, valorization. One of them, uh, it will be fermented in it. So I guess the next speaker will speak a lot about those kind of applications. Maybe not for bread, but uh, I will come slightly uh, on it after that. And then if not possible, you can still, again, by biological way, get some energy production or incinerate it. So this is, in theory at least, the global Ladder you should go on. First try to prevent and then a process. So we can say, oh, that's general. Does it apply to, to, to bread? The only detailed study I know for bread uh, that was again uh, done in Sweden uh, on a complete uh, 
life cycle analysis from the different steps confirmed globally that indeed in terms of impact it's better to, to follow this uh, this general scheme with just some uh, um, some nuance, I would say, some uh, uh, on the fact that uh, all these elements here in the between, in the middle, from uh, processing for new food, using as animal feed, or uh, processing for fermentation, have nearly the same impact. In final, globally, when you do a life cycle analysis, so okay, here there is a hierarchy, but in there, you know that it's better to avoid it's clearly than all the transformation or nearly have uh, the same um, um, the same global impact, and then energy uh, recovery is uh, what you should at least do in ki those kind of situ situation. And if we look at it globally, we can see the, the global uh, scheme uh, uh, as this. We can see where we are creating those waste and what we can do from that. So globally, you have a supply chain going from the bakery. So I won't go before that, of course, thinking about what you are using to do the, the bread might be important as well. But since you have the bread, you have the bakery and the retail, and then the household, which accounts for the largest part of the of the bread uh, consumption and some elements in the canteen and the restaurant. All of them have uh, what can be waste or avoidable uh, waste. So the bakery and the retail, you have production uh, excess or uh, unsold product. And depending on, on the country and on what you're looking for, in fact, uh, you will have more of, of one or the other because it depends on the, the link that you have between the bakery and the retailer. And that's, that link is quite important in order to correctly avoid, um, uh, uh, avoid the waste by avoiding producing too much or uh, a low, uh, allocating too much bread at some uh, retail uh, position and so on. So there already you have some um, some prevention to do. Then the products you have, which are unsold or uh, over production, globally um, are nice products. In fact, they are totally eatable. So the first thing you should try to see is can you donate it? Uh, it's that donation will require some uh, some transport and some extra energy. So in fact, it's not as good as using it directly in the, uh, as a production, but that's uh, always what you should uh, try to do. Then you have the list of what is more interesting uh, for, for the engineer I am, which are all the transformation we have there. If no other choice, that product could go with the rest and with the residuals you have from household, the restaurant, so on. That part, it's difficult to consider them as a, a good um, uh, a good starting point for uh, advanced production. So what you can just do with it is uh, energy, and you can try to, to to have a work on that. But we've seen that this was indeed a large part. Uh, I had mentioned previously about 68 percent. So on that part, unfortunately, we don't have magical solution. But um, we can still try to uh, in phase on avoiding the waste uh, as, uh, as always. And so I will mostly focus on uh, the other parts. So I've mentioned multiple applications. Uh, of course, beer production. Uh, if we cannot do beer, uh, we will speak about this. Um, so uh, here in beer production, what we do is use the starch uh, that is available uh, to replace uh, malt and barley in um, the production. That can go up to 40% uh, of, uh, of replacement in order to um, get the starch, but still having the uh, key enzymatic uh, enzymes that are present in malt uh, and that are required to do a, a good beer. So you cannot just say, oh, I will do a fully um, uh, a fully bread-based um, beer. That does not work. And you have some products. So here I took three examples. B Babylon beer is a, it's a Brussels beer, uh, La Miche uh, as well. It's quite kind of funny, or I don't know if it's really funny, but you have a similar product with the same name, but totally uh, different uh, history in France. Also La Miche, also based on uh, some part of, uh, um, of bread that exists. I've uh, 
recently discovered a toast that's more in England, where they are uh, having the same, uh, same idea. So here, the principle is uh, quite simple. You use directly the bread for its starch. It has limitations because you might, for example, have some bread that contains some oil elements, depending on their, their composition, and that oil might, uh, might inhibit the, uh, the foaming of the beer. And if a beer doesn't foam, don't know if it's still a beer. Uh, another uh, application, uh, which is the one that brought me to, uh, to, to, to this subject, is reusing your bread after milling, again, as a flour source. Why not? Up to some extent, you can still use it uh, there. Still, we've seen that with all the reaction we had, we've lost some nutritional values and we have already fixed some structure. So it's not possible to make it rise again. That won't work. You will have something that is, yes, less, uh, slightly less nutritional than a classical um, floor, but still it's usable. A few years ago, some of my students did create in the in a European contest um, uh, a cone for ice cream that was with a speculous taste. You need to have some Belgian points there, uh, but based only on flour that was in fact um, milled bread. And this was uh, really a success, and that's a really interesting. Uh, application that can be uh, that that be, uh, can be used there. You cannot do new bread based on uh, old bread, but biscuits and things like that are totally possible. And you can see some bakeries in France that are using that, for example, to do, make some um, some cakes with uh, part of it. It's somehow you can use it at, as a loading agent in your uh, in your system. Then. As also mentioned, you can ferment uh, it. And as soon as you enter fermentation, you are opening a totally new uh, world. The starch you have is not necessarily easily uh, used by all the microorganisms, but you can have some uh, more advanced processing in order to transform them to highly um, and easily uh, usable sugar and then do some fermentation. And with everything that exists nowadays in fermentation and uh, heterolog uh, expression of, uh, I won't say whatever you want, but many different products, you you can imagine doing many, many different production. So I, in theory, whatever ca that can be uh, uh, um, uh, generated by yeast uh, could be uh, obtained based on uh, uh, on bread. I took here just three examples that have been tested and uh, based on bread. So ethanol, lactic acids, xanthan, but honestly, there the possibilities are in theory, at least uh, nearly infinite. So we've seen we have a lot of possibilities. So we could say, OK, let's go. Let's go with that. Still, there are some challenges there. And the first challenge is, of course, that we are starting from a waste. So we are starting from something that has a really low value and except maybe for the fermentation, what you will get after is still a quite low added value product. So you cannot do uh, miracles. You, you have to, to work with something that is quite uh, efficient. In, uh, you're not in the pharmaceutical industry where uh, margins are really large. You will really be uh, fastly blocked by costs. And the costs that we will see will arise mostly uh, about two problems. And the first problem is logistics. We've been discussing, okay, you have bakeries, you have retails, you have consumers. They all have some waste. So that waste is quite distributed. You will, you will need, if you want to uh, have some uh, stable uh, feed of bread, you will need an important logistic. And still, what uh, is seen in many situations is that that flux is highly variable, which is not really good for process that we treat continuously. So you need to buffer that. Buffering means conserv conserving, and conservation is not necessarily trivial. Yes, bread can stay this way sometimes, but only a few days. You can, of course, say that can be a solution. Use cold fridge freezer. You can go further, but you are exploding the cost already. That's quite expensive. 
The last solution, and that's where I come back with my initial thing, is drying. Can I just remove the water so I will have a shelf-stable um, bread product uh, easily that will be reusable uh, anytime? Of course, you can directly use the fresh product if possible, but if you really need to uh, buffer things, uh, you will need typically some dry. And in fact, uh, I will only speak a little bit about that, but that's what I'm focusing on in my research is how can I improve that, uh, that drying? Because in fact, bread doesn't contain that much water. So you have six, for one kilogram of dry matter, you have 600 grams of water. Compared to many other foods, that's not a lot at all. Still, we've mentioned we have, are in something that is really low added value. And so the cost become fastly a problem. Do we have enough space? Can I buy that space? What will I have to invest as a, as a dryer? And what will it cost? Drying is expensive in terms of heat. We know that energy costs are rising at the moment. They will uh, always be. So what's the solution? When we analyze the different uh, solution, we can see that at really large scale, like usual, and that's the principle of uh, process engineering, if you go in a scale that's large enough, at some point, yes, it will be um, uh, it will be manageable, profitable to uh, invest in a dryer. But still, the larger the scale, the more logistical problem you ha will have. So one of my goal is to be able to reduce that scale to be sure that uh, we are able to uh, invest in, uh, in dryers uh, that are small enough in order to, to make sense in regard of local communities, for example. At really small scale, what some people tell me is just, oh, but it's okay, my bread, I can just leave it there and it will dry on its own. And that's true. Sometimes we have to say, okay, technology might not but that be the solution. In that situation, the key issue is more microbiology. Are you sure that you will have a product that will be clean enough to be reused? In intermediate scale, which is as often the most uh, uh, common one, uh, it's difficult to say. Just leaving the bread will give you a, night a microbiological nightmare. Uh, investing in a new dryer won't be possible. And there, what we recommend is to try to do synergies with existing uh, systems. Dryers that are not used all the time, furnace or uh, oven, uh, so sorry, so uh, oven, so typically in bakery, when the uh, oven are not used, you can use them for drying, and that can be a, a, a solution in order to use heat that is anyway lost uh, when the, 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 the oven are uh, cooling down, for example, and use it, th them to uh, to have the, um, the, the, the reduction of, um, of the humidity content of your bread. What I'm working on, in fact, is to see how we can intensify that drying in order to have it really fast and really short. I won't go into much detail, but just before I was speaking, uh, coming here, I was speaking with the master students, and now with com uh, complete drinking, we are now able to, uh, in controlled uh, manner, dry bread in three minutes. So, in fact, the drying time is not a problem at all anymore. What is limiting for us nowadays is that to dry in three minutes, we need a certain amount of heat and it's eating all the systems. That is the limiting point. And so working continuously could work even at small scale. And we try, we hope to be able to uh, go further into, um, into that in the uh, coming future. So that will be all. In fact, finally, I spoke only a little bit about uh, the drying because I think it was more interesting to have a, a global approach. Um, so in conclusion, uh, I think uh, the movement scale is in fact the best conclusion I can have. We have a lot of waste there. Prevention is the best thing. And for what we cannot prevent, we have quite a lot of possibilities, things that might be done um, in order to, 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 uh, to, to use those waste and to valorize uh, them as much as possible. But the choice that should be made depend on, based on the different situation should really be uh, focused on the local availability and the local system, the price of energy and what can be uh, considered as in terms of scale. So that will be my, uh, my end remark. And I thank you very much for your attention.
presentation and the questions in the audience. And I see there is a super long question from Yeru in the chat. <laughs> Maybe it's better for you to read. Okay, I will read it. Uh, yes, thank you. Spoke about drying by means of heat, but you will also have freeze drying. In which cases do you prefer one versus the other? Yes. So freeze drying is the best way of drying uh, to uh, conserve the product. So you will have less uh, heat degradation. So globally, the the the, the bread we see here is uh, quite resistant to uh, to to. to moderate heating in, in drying. So we typically dry at 60, 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, and so that's a situation we don't really uh, degrade the, um, the, um, the product. So the main advantage of freeze drying is to better preserve the product, but here it's not really uh, uh, damaged by the drying. Okay, sorry, uh, indeed. So um, uh, here the, the product is not really damaged uh, by the by the drying. Freeze drying, um, in fact, uh, requires to go low in temperature and then have a really long drying because at low temperature it will be really uh, uh, slow. So in fact, you have a long time of uh, slow drying that tends to be more expensive in terms of energy than uh, average temperature uh, drying like 60 or 70 degrees. So that's why I wouldn't go for freeze drying. But I think freeze drying might be uh, a good opportunity to save other foods that are way more sensitive and that we also want to dry. So uh, we spoke about uh, raspberry, for example. Uh, if you are not able to conserve uh, the, the way uh, the previous speaker proposed, a way to uh, uh, um, save them would be to freeze dry them. So, um, so I, I had that Babylon beer last night. It was really fantastic. Um, but that brings me to my my question, which is, with beer, people care about quality, right? So, using stale bread may not be worthwhile. But um, with something like whiskey or some aged spirit that that's then distilled, did you investigate that? Because it seems like that might be maybe a better use. Yes, uh, I, I never went. Uh... The, uh, to, 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 to the whiskey or the distillated product. So it's true that, uh, and, and that's under investigation at uh, UC Louvain, so another university uh, quite close from here, what's the impact on uh, using bread on the aromas that you have in those, uh, in those um, beers? Well, honestly, I'm, I like beer, but I cannot really make the fine difference, especially start doing that. But indeed, if you begin by dist uh, distillating, you will also uh, keep some specific aromas. So it might have an impact. It, it would be a really nice uh, uh, study indeed. So you mentioned the, the logistics of all of this, and I'm just wondering how you're imagining some of these logistical things occurring. So you talked about grinding and drying. Are you, are you imagining that this would happen like in a bakery or at some sort of centralized location after you have collected bread? Uh, is, is the ground uh, dried bread just gonna go back into the into the new bread? Or so for me, that's really an open question. Uh, so in France, they have now. Um, uh, uh, commercialized a small uh, grinder that, uh, that is dedicated to the bakery size. And so they are a lot focusing on doing that directly at the bakery. Uh, that's clearly one interesting model. Um, and I think it should uh, also be seen in regard of the global uh, way the, the bread is produced and retailed in a, sp a specific place. Uh, France, Belgium rely quite a lot on small bakeries. Uh, other countries are more uh, have more centralized system, and I think you should adapt uh, on that in order to to match. And for example, to use uh, already existing transport, uh, but in, in the other direction. I bring fresh bread. I take old bread back, and I I, I can then have uh, some some work on it without adding any uh, extra kilometers, for example. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, I still didn't have time to to fully read it. Um, um, talking about the movement. I think we should do better for you. Uh, yes. Um, so indeed, uh, all uh, old can be the. Hmm? So uh, if I understand well, there is a part of the question is uh, old can be the bread. Um, 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 uh, no, uh, oh, much old bread. No, so uh, th that's true. The, the question of the global flux. Uh, can we not just use everything and donation and then uh, the, the rest wouldn't be uh, useful? Um, that's really uh, uh, an important point that we've been uh, uh, discussing uh, a few times with some um, um, so organization also in Brussels. Um, we are at the moment collecting so small amounts that we don't see that uh, competition rising. But that's true. That's a, that's really the point. Uh, the, the global competition between for for, for a waste somehow, uh, which can seem crazy if you think about it. Uh, we at some point we consider it waste, and the day after we see it as, as a resource, and we we will be in competition. So it's true that um, in what I'm proposing might not be uh, relevant if uh, everything can be used uh, directly, um, can directly be 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 be, be donated. Uh, I fully agree. Yeah. So thanks for such a nice presentation. As you mentioned, uh, yes, we have a plenty of possibilities to recover Verizon, to valorize what is Verizon in many new, new ways. Uh, about uh, the idea of using Verizon, it's not so possible, uh, that it's uh, just a little bit of percentage because uh, the, the gluten is uh, the natural diet of uh, baking, with baking, so it being protein. So it cannot uh, contribute to the natural formation again. So that's why. Just in Italy, we reuse fast dry pasta after grinding, after shredding, after milling, but uh, up to very little bit, I don't know, about 5%. Uh, you know, we can recover a uh, lot, but uh, not a uh, high percentage. Uh, otherwise, the quality lowers too much. But uh, uh, analyzing the reason of uh, why uh, we have such a high percentage of uh, bread waste is in uh, Brussels, for example, or in the Flanders, you mentioned that up to 25% uh, of bread is wasted. It could be interesting to try contributing to get the solution of this problem because we have uh, many, many remedies uh, at the end of this process, but we should work more at the beginning because uh, that's the point. Also, trying to extend a little bit the bread chef life in a, enhancing the quality, for example, enhancing and sensitizing bakers in using sourdough, which is a very good system to enhance a little bit, not by adding oils or fats or amylase or other additives, and, you know, but just sourdough gives us a very good quality bread, which is based to up to one week more or less. And becomes better and better every day. That's the best system. So we should combine. So sorry for such a long <laughs> comments about uh, at the end. Uh, have you any idea about why we have such a high percentage of bread waste in this area where we are now? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not totally sure about it, uh, far from that, but globally, uh, Belgian like uh, the, the bread re really fresh globally, uh, or, or like in France uh, as well. And so that, that's one of the reasons at household. The other reason uh, I see more uh, uh, on the retail side is that we have a really, really large assortment. We have really a lot of different breads, and it's um, because we want to have availability of all of them nearly all the time it means that the stocks are uh, more uh, divided and uh, so you have more waste so uh, i know that the danish company reduced its uh, 
uh, its assortment of one fourth, so they only kept three thirds of the different breads they had, and that allowed them to reduce of 67 percent their uh, their total uh, amount of waste, uh, with just two percent of loss in, in the sales. So in fact, the global benefits was clear for them as well. So I think that's one thing in Belgium which we should think about. And we see the diversity of bread that are available to us. Uh, maybe we don't need to have all of them all the time. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. I did not so much have a question, but just wanted to make a comment. Uh, if we look at historical uh, situations or traditional societies, you often see that the drying is done at the beginning of the process. So really in the prevention phase. Uh, the breads are made that are very dry, and often there's also very fuel efficient because you can make a whole lot all at once, and then you re-moister it before you start eating it. And for instance, with the ships, biscuits, but also with, with rusk or with uh, certain traditional flatbreads, that a whole village community makes a, a month's worth of bread, and then moisten it with oil or wine uh, over time. So I'm not sure if we can do something with that today, but I just wanted to add it. Yeah, I totally agree. Freshness of product, which is a recent uh, focus, uh, is part of the problem. Uh, if we directly went to more dried product, uh, it would probably be better and we would also have less waste, indeed. Thank you. Very much. Uh, there is no more question on the chat. No. Well, I don't see. Okay. So then we move to our next speaker. Are you getting loaded up? Have you ever considered using bit, like Bitcoin servers as dryers? Yes, ten percent of the world's energy. Might as well use them. <laughs> So, yeah, our next speaker is Mr. Yannick Scandiné of Fermentings. Fermentings is a Brussels-based company that is dedicated to all facets of fermentation and food preservation. Since 2017, they have been combining being a bottle shop with aspects of being a restaurant and catering service, with giving workshops and also with being a producer. With the help of a B Circular grant since 2021, uh, Fermentings is also developing its own research and development through its own Vermant lab which is focused on what they call circular fermentation, aimed at the utilization of secondary products and food waste, on which Yannick will be telling us more today. And with that, I would like to give the floor to Yannick. So hello, I'm Yannick. I'm really pleased to, to be here. Uh, uh, it's quite interesting because it's going to continue on the discussion that uh, came before. Um, I'm not at all, in fact, uh, in the world of science from the beginning. I'm more social scientist. Uh, first, I did uh, philosophy uh, and then sociology. Uh, but at the end, I came into the world of, of food uh, through the passion of beer. So uh, I studied beer brewing and from there out I wanted to learn more about all the possibilities of fermentation and I stopped in fact brewing beer and doing all the other uh, aspects. But what I found out is that there is quite a methodology behind that can be reproduced through all types of uh, fermentation. Uh, so what, uh, what I'm going to do today is a bit looking first at the history of fermentation from where do we, does it come? Why do we have it in society? Uh, and then go further on what we did the last year. So really looking into the usage of spent grains and to uh, try other te techniques uh, through fermentation. And the conclusion that we came up to being that, that concept of circular fermentation. Um, so 
how do I mostly describe in the workshops or in the events uh, the idea of uh, fermentation is in fact it's mostly an accident. Uh, we think that the human body got alcohol in him from about 30,000 years ago uh, by going into beehives uh, that were submerged with water. You had yeasts from the surroundings and it started fermenting and it created the, uh, the old meat uh, family and uh, the human uh, was uh, starting to drink it. But when we see more the organization of fermented products, we're looking at a time frame of between 8,000 and 4,000, depending on where uh, in the world we, we are. Uh, we see starts in Ethiopia, we see it in China, but we see also in Georgia, uh, for example, in Georgia, uh, for example, with the first wines uh, recipients. And the idea there was mostly out of necessity that people were fermenting. So we were stopping to be nomad people. Uh, we were gathering lots of different foods and we were trying to survive through the winter or through periods of times where there was not a lot of food. So we were finding out by accident, mostly uh, cheese was an accident because they were trying to preserve milk and within the right conditions, it was changing to yogurt, to cheese. So we see it appearing but everywhere in, uh, in the world. And we're using that until almost the 1950s. I'm here talking about European perspective, how it evolves here, because in other parts of the world, we're still actively using those techniques uh, now. What's happening in the 1950s? We have two things that arrives. We have the refrigerator and we have the supermarket that's coming. And those two make it quite unnecessary to have, uh, in fact, the, the skills and the techniques of fermentations in home. So we see a loss of that knowledge on not even two generations, uh, where grandmothers were still preserving even the gems of, of their gardens, but having out of necessity different techniques by hand, by the fact that there is a fridge and there is the grocery store, we don't need uh, to preserve. So there is a complete loss here in Europe of uh, that, that specific knowledge. We're still yeah, brewing beer, making bread, but even there we see through industry relation, the sourdough uh, aspect, for example, is completely lost through uh, other more industrial uh, techniques. Uh, when in the beginning of the 2000s, there is a more health-based uh, approach to food and fermentation is coming back. Uh, one of the first notable books is uh, The Art of Fermentation from Sander Katz. Um, he's writing first out of a health-based perspective, uh, the uh, fact that all the probiotics are there, that there's a lot of good bacteria for him in his, in his um, writing, helps him go through his cancer on a more easier way. And that creates a sort of hype around the fermentation aspect. At the same time, you have that whole idea of trying to work more locally and high-end restaurants, if they want to uh, work more locally, they will need to re rework with preserving, preservation techniques and fermentation techniques. Uh, most notable uh, restaurant in the world using fermentation is Noma in Copenhagen. Um, it's in fact because of one rule he brought in the kitchen. He said everything needs to be within the 50 kilometer range of the restaurant that we're going to use. And because of that, because being in Denmark, you don't have a lot of fresh vegetables and fruits at one certain point of time. So fermentation came back into the kitchen. They dedicated a really a lot of resources to it. And through the, the last decades, they become the top one restaurant in the world, three star Michelin uh, restaurant by introducing uh, that fermentation um, aspect. And from there out, you see a lot of new books uh, coming out in the last 10, 15 years about all the different aspects of, uh, of fermentation. Um, what I want to introduce here is in fact the follow-up where it was their really high-end uh, and also the really healthy part. Uh, it's bringing it back in the everyday usage. Uh, we see it's still a bit difficult. 
Um, but through what we have, in fact, more and more data, also more and more interest from universities. We know what at the VUB there is a program uh, that's going to be set up uh, around fermentation about yeast cultures, uh, about how with the wild yeasts within within the lambic and those kind of families are being studied. Uh, there is a lot of uh, um, knowledge available and there is also an easiness more to uh, apprehend it and to create products um, out of it. So what we're trying to bring and now in the next couple of years is really that systematic view of uh, fermentation. So how did it start? It was in fact uh, we set up a B circular. Um, it's a fund uh, here in Brussels to create more circular um, pro a circular product uh, with the idea to use pen grains but with one challenge to not use the drying part. Uh, why? Because of the problem of the ecological impact of the energy creation. Uh, we were doing some tests on a really specific uh, bacteria that's the most fungi. Uh, it's kojikin, uh, Japanese uh, bacteria uh, that has that facility to digest much more starch and proteins uh, and to go much farther into the fermentation uh, creating some citric acid, acids, acetic acids, uh, lactic acids also, and creating a quite complex mouthfeel without having too much yeast. We're still in the in the test phase, so we we're at a 1.5% in alcohol. We try to stabilize that, but we see that in fact kojikin is a type of bacteria quite active. So what we did, um, we're uh, centered next to four different breweries, which makes it easy to get uh, some fresh uh, spent grains, because that's also one of the big problems is that the decay of spent grains is really fast. If it's not processed in the day that it's the beer is made, too much lactic acids, uh, I, lactic bacteria are in the environment and it just starts to rot. And for the uh, further fermentation process, it's not uh, nice. And so what we try to do is uh, three different products with it. So the lemonades, uh, we call them the dramas, uh, which are now in a phase where we need just the CO2 stabilization in bottle. Um, we have the amino paste and sauces. So uh, instead of going for the shoyu and miso name, the Japanese names for it, because that's related to the soya bean, here the amino is the general name of that type of, of fermentation. So we're making pastes out of the spent grains uh, where we have an interesting taste profile but problematic texture because it's not uh, breaking down the fibers. Even after now six months of fermentation, we're looking later on to a year uh, of fermentation that we don't know, and sauces. And there we see in fact if we go for um, spent grains from uh, for example a, a, an imperial stout really strong black beer we we uh, having quite a leftover out of it to create a nice uh, flavor profile and to have a chocolate and even um yeah a bit more coffee taste in the soya sauce that we that we have left problem at the moment is that the scalability is not yet there um we're uh, we're looking at a process where we're using maybe 80 kilograms of uh, spent grains to create around 60, 70 liters of lemonade at the end. Uh, we're looking at 15 kilos of spent grains to have 10, 12 liters of, of soy sauce. So it's still in the in the early phase of development. But what we see is that high end restaurants are interested in it because they have new flavor profiles and they have non alcoholic drinks that have the same type of acidic profile as Geuze and Lambic. Uh, we are now also doing it with spent grains from Cantillon and from BBP, their new uh, program. So we are doing also two types of, of, uh, of techniques where we do the heating process, which is called Amazake, uh, which is a way to, uh, to, do the, to get much of the sugars out of it. Uh, and we do barrels. Uh, once more, the classical uh, Japanese way to make soya also, but it's quite intensive. 
What we would like to see is in fact that we can reuse the barrels from beer breweries and that in their own places they could fill it up with the dresh with the koji and just let it ferment in the in the same environment but we're coming later on to why that could be some some problems um, what we're trying to do is really to look at that ecological footprint uh, it's not only with the used um, the reused materials but also in fact in um, looking at what type of materials we can take out uh, of the of the chain and use fermentation uh, with testing out koji kin we saw also that it's uh, got a really good work on ripening certain unripened fruits and vegetables we received 250 kilo of green tomatoes of a farmer that he explained well i have around two tons every year of green unused tomatoes that's at the end of a good season bad season it's worse find me a product that uh, that we could uh, start processing by the use of fermentation um, we did around 20 uh, different uh, techniques of fermentations at the end at the moment still the chutney which is more a preservation technique is the most viable and stable product to go to market but we saw that we could ripen in them in it's called shiokoji it's in fact um, a secondary project if your koji fails over sporulates you can create a marinade out of it and put uh, vegetables in it and they will continue the ripening process and um, the um, uh, how do you call it again the um, yeah the, the creation of the of the sugar crystals uh, will make really interesting uh, taste profiles out of it so you will have a bit of peachy taste uh, at the end super interesting for high-end restaurants not yet scalable on a, on a big uh, big scale so why, why is fermentation why did it a bit uh, lose part of interest um, for through the, the the studies that we made we saw in fact that um, once pasteurizations come into into play there is a whole fear of bacteria and there is a whole also uh, trying to control the environment in which we are so every bacteria is a possible bad bacteria and we see it in within the classical craftsmanships um, we take we go back to beer but we take the the story of the lambic uh, if uh, bone wouldn't have fought between the 80s and the 2000s on European level to see it as a tradition Geuze would not be able to exist anymore because the environment wherein lambic is made it's in open fermentations it's in a place that can't be cleaned because all the bacteria the, uh, the bruxellensis bretanomyces which is there is created to be uh, in contact with the beer at that moment uh, even the spiders have their role in the whole ecosystem uh, it's a bit a romantic view but it's also true um, for the geuze makers uh, to have the possibility to have living organisms uh, laying around and what bone did was going on the european level to see it as a part of the heritage cultural heritage and through that it was possible to continue their production but in other uh, if that wasn't the case it would have been like the now battle of the fromage de herve which is also uh with with more uh, wild uh yeasts wild bacteria you see that uh there is that um, that frightened part towards the bacteria and that aseptization of of uh, society and of food the food place in uh, in general uh we are an oddity for the AFSCA and FAVV. Uh, they don't understand everything we do. Uh, it's a good thing, but we need to really be gentle and explain every step we take, why we take it. Especially they're scared about the cross-contamination between different um, types of fermentation we do. So we create a protocol between every type of ferment. Uh, if you book the, the day to work on koji, 
there is no possibility that that day other types of fermentations are done in the in the production space cleanage with alcohol it's it's for every type of ferment we created uh, also a cleaning process but we find it important to still give the place to moments for wild yeasts we have barrels laying around that are just outside of our uh, of our uh, locale to work a bit on more wild uh, wild stuff um, other thing is in fact when you see companies starting in the fermentation world from a craft perspective it's quite interesting until the moment you need to scale once you need to scale you have to be much more in control of your product and there through the, the, the way our food industry works, it's quite impossible for living products to go towards a bigger, uh, bigger scale. I take the example often with kombucha. Uh, kombucha is a fermented tea. And if you want to respect the, uh, the, the, the bacterial environment and have a living product when you sell it, you need to keep it in a cold environment. And so on a small scale, if you're selling directly, you're selling with restaurants, it works. But once you go to a bigger scale, you have a problem that not all places have space in their fridge. They will say, yeah, no, you can put it on the shelf, but fridge place, it's more expensive. It's not for your product. So they go towards pasteurization, pascalization. They go for a controlled environment, but then it becomes not really a living product anymore. You're more into a lemonade, inspired by a kombucha. Lactofermentation, same thing. Uh, we try to control by the pH level, but if I do miscalculation on the sugar content, it can be that the fermentation continues at one point, and I have, uh, I have a, 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 a pot that is active when you open it and you have bubbles out of it, and people are panicking because it's alive. What does it do? Uh, so it's the whole education through it and the little bit of the problem of the of that industrialization uh, part. Uh, and then the last part we already explained with FAVV, the whole food legislation is not as far as the possibilities that give uh, that give the fermentation environment. Koji, we don't even start with that. Now it's about the, the acetic uh, fermentation and we explain how that works, but with once they we're going to see if we make we make charcuterie with beets through koji fermentation. I don't know how we're going to give it a pass through FRVV, but that's our game that we want that we want to play. So, what's our idea then with the circle of fermentation? It's in fact to set up a process where uh, all those different unusable or raw materials or secondary materials like the green tomatoes, like the uh, beer draf, uh, but also um, with the, there was a good example with the end of the um, oven, the rest of the energy. There is in fact a French uh, classical recipe of the mustard bowl. And so it's simply mustard seeds, vinegar, um, a bit of flour, and they will mix it in balls. And when they were finished with baking the bread, they were throwing in those balls into that oven. It was drying. And then you just need it to grate a bit of the mustard bowl, mix it again with vinegar, and you had mustard all year long. And it's a 17th century little uh, information, but it could be something that a company can, can create, can be using. So we want to track, in fact, all those little parts of knowledge, um, optimize them and see how it can be scaled and bring it, uh, bring it to other, other companies, other uh, projects. Uh, the, the really good example here in, in Belgium, uh, we're coming back to it where we have now 20 uh, breweries in, um, in Brussels alone, uh, 15 years ago, two, 20 years ago, there was only one left, it was Cantillon. Uh, in the beginning of the of the 20th century, end of the 19th, there were more than 100 brew pubs, small breweries around town, and often they were connected with vinegar makers because batches were not so stable, and you you had the alcohol creation that was there, so you could make vinegar. So you had a direct connection between two uh, two makers, and that's a bit what what our proposition is uh, to do. 
we have a network of farmers uh, that have leftover products, that have products that they don't know what, how to also make it more valuable. Uh, we work three days now with a, a farmer that's um, growing soy, but the soy on itself is not that valuable. But if you are making soy sauce barrel aged in his wine, in, because there's a winery too, then you're getting a product that you can sell at a much higher price with a much higher value. So the idea for us is that those people come to our lab, that we work with universities, that we work with also market leaders in really specific fields. Uh, we have a really good brewer in the Netherlands that's building up a great fermentation company specific on lacto-fermentation using brewery techniques, which is super interesting, and bringing that to production hubs uh, because they're starting to get more and more places uh, that's also social, there is a social impact in it, that where the final production on a bigger scale could be done, uh, where we just do the test and then they come into their own type of loop where it's just between the farm and the production hub and a marketing or a distribution hub, somebody doing the, uh, the distribution. So for us, it's really grabbing all that that knowledge all the testing we had uh, we did the last the last five years and and setting it up as a more uh, open open source part two towards uh, reducing uh, reducing waste and finding um, yeah lost materials of parts of lost materials that we could put into uh, a chain what are the future challenges it's um, first of all it's when we're talking about this, this is not something scalable, exponential. It's always a thing of human scale economy. It's small projects. It's you're talking always with humans. You don't have that possible impact on a bigger scale, but you have to create a lot of little uh, connections. Um, it's quite difficult to find the right economical uh, um, yeah, um, value uh, within it. Second thing is scarcity of resources that's coming more and more into problems. Uh, we're talking about uh, simple access to certain types of, of uh, primal uh, produce, but also fermentation tanks. That's mostly a Chinese market, uh, but and fooders, for example. But the problem is the containers uh, went 10 times up uh, in price, and now certain breweries are not able to ship new type of installations uh, that will be able to use those new uh, new techniques. Uh, the unexpected ecological uh, parts, uh, when we're talking with farmers the last couple of years were so, uh, so difficult into finding a normal routine within it. The tomato crisis of last year that was N on a uh, on there was a, a disease on the tomatoes in the beginning of seasons and the fact that the temperatures uh, dropped, that the, that the ripen process was not done. So how can we act on that part too? And then the marketing via uh, edu education. Um, we take that role of education really strongly, but we know that it's a long and hard work to explain every type of fermentation uh, where we, we're seeing that certain people with really good marketing skills are being able to bring that uh, that knowledge to simplify it at the same time, but uh, scoring it. And it's at the same time difficult when talking about kombucha, but having a kombucha that comes from Portugal to Brussels, there is no chance that it's a, a real livable product. Uh, there is some locality uh, to it, and so sometimes marketing is stronger than uh, than the real aspect of any of these of these products. Um, so when um, asked to to do a lecture today, we we talked about okay, how do we see then the future of that fermentation uh, fermented food? Uh, so we go towards uh, again uh, the fungi family, but it's mostly a, a mycelium of local and small food actors that are really aware of what resources are around and balancing it uh, between them. Um, we take the example of there is now a, a producer of koji in Brussels. Well, we're making less koji because they are professionalizing 
on a bigger scale that part and we just now searching clients on which we can work uh, together and to see all those little connections being made and trying to make it as local uh, as possible. Voila. Are there any questions? Hi, thank you for that talk. It was very insightful and interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the, the underlying economics. Because you talked about scale, that was a big thing in your discussion. And I'm wondering, you know, because ultimately when you deal with the, the, the product, you know, your gross margin is the aspect that drives whether or not scalability is sort of worth it, how much potential energy is there to drive scale, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit, you talked a little bit about the ratio of spit grain to different products that you're working on, but in, in terms of the cost of that material, if you're working from spent grain, I mean, what is that? The kilogram of spent grain is on a, even underneath one ton is quite is as free. Okay. Um, so there is no, there is not really the problem of the price. It's the koji and especially the koji making, uh, making the sporification on uh, a kind of legumineux mm -hmm. is costs one person three days of work. And you make three kilo or you make 30 kilo, it's three days of follow up uh, because you need a certain humidity level, a certain temperature that needs to be followed up. And depending on what, gr on what grain you're growing, mm -hmm. it could be that it goes faster and slower. The period of time wherein it sporulates, it between 24 and 72 hours, depending on the type of spore and uh, the type of, of grain. And so if you're a bit more learning about the process, you still have a range of six hours that it can go from going well to oversporulated. So you have to have somebody monitoring it through the three, uh, three days. And that's where the biggest price point is. That's why the lemonade is not viable uh, because of the production of koji. That's why the soy sauce it's much more val valuable because you need less koji, you get a product that is high end and that you can sell and at a better at a better price. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there a link between or a relation between um, the knowledge about fermentation and climate? That is, are there really differences between, say, the north of Europe and, uh, and say, the equator and, and different climates? Yeah, the, uh, depending on the climate, because one of the important factors in fermentation is temperature. You will see that depending on the temperature and also the humidity level, you will have locally typical fermentation that will uh, will be created. Uh, you have tempeh in Indonesia. Why did tempeh grow there easily? It's because you have that high humidity and warm climate that gave the environment that type of bacteria to grow. Um, and that's that you see that certain type of fermentation will not be able to be uh, to be done. Uh, where for us, for our fermentation, it's quite here in Europe, it's quite uh, linked to more the colder climates and the winter periods where you see most of the fermentation culture is there. Uh, um, in other places, you will have more short, uh, short type of fermentation because of the heat, uh, heat environment, uh, for example. So the, the climate of the, of the place depends, uh, uh, depends a lot on the type of fermentation. So really, really fascinating. Uh, where I am in, in Texas, in the U.S., the most valuable beer is Jester King, which is they. If you're familiar with them, they use voters and yeah, yeah, yeah. And, wild yeast. Um, and and really interesting stuff. Um, I'm not clear on your business model though. So you have like a, a a small production facility or kitchen, and then you rent that out to other people, and they come and make the koji, or you do it. Or so at, at the moment, we're doing it. We're doing most of the research ourselves, but the idea is to 
built more towards like what a fab lab is as a model okay. for the the food specific fermentation so we have already like um, a local um, baker that is doing only so sourdough sourdough bakers uh, bakes but is also bringing a uh, research on grain on lost grain types uh, that's linked with um, Driefontein and so we're trying to find interesting people wanting to go further into the fermentation um, and set them up there so the facility is being to uh, is setting up to be open at the moment it's mostly us doing uh, doing it ourselves okay and they rent it out and yeah. So you own this facility or the region owns this facility? How did this come about? So it's in fact, I started more as a as a simple bottle shop, in fact, okay. uh, but through uh, through changes through COVID, we went deeper and deeper into the research part and we saw that in fact it was where we love being the most. And so now we're, we're setting up uh, yeah, dossiers with region with uh, different levels of, of government to say, OK, look, we are building up a food lab where we are uh, bringing knowledge towards who, uh, who needs that knowledge. All right, well, not for a question. If you're getting spent brewer's grains, uh, those already are, are probably getting fairly hot with bacteria and whatnot. So are you are you sterilizing those first or do you just hope your inoculant outcompetes what you get? So depending on the brewery, that's it's we take that in consideration uh, that some of them have more bacterial environment than others. Um, BBP is always rinsing it just before with the 90 degrees uh, water, where we know that the typical bacteria that we will found will not have survived. Where when we go to uh, Lawak, it's it's really not the same type of facility. So there we have more uh, external bacteria, and so we do higher salting level of depending on what type of product we uh, we make out of it. Are there any more questions at this time? Oh. Thanks for a nice presentation. Just a curiosity, you told that uh, in the past, uh, in 19th century, there were vinegar makers close to uh, breweries. Uh, did they use, did they use, uh, I don't know, wasted beer or not good beer or other waste from the beer? Sure it's, it's mostly not good enough beer okay. uh, because those breweries were are having installations that was summary, maybe a 200 liter brew making it constantly for their, their little place. You had bad batches in it, and so vinegar was uh, made out of it. Thank you. Are there any more questions also in the chat, maybe? Uh, okay, then I would like to thank you again. <laughs> and I think we have a little more time, so if there are any points maybe for discussion, then we could open the floor to a little bit of discussion. Uh, one of the points that... Oh, well, I can stop actually using the microphone, maybe that's better. Uh, one of the points that came uh, from the fore in a few of the presentations is the role of legislation. And uh, how do you guys, say, especially when I'm looking at the speakers, but also at the other participants, how do you look at the role of this sort of legislation in uh, the innovation process? Is it something that can just stifle or is it also something that can be helpful in a way to thrive innovation uh, or are there ways to work around it? I see. Uh... observations that I've made about and, and actually uh, you mentioned kind of a similar idea that uh, uh, food safety legislation in particular is very challenging uh, to this upscaling uh, any of these types of innovations that, that use processes that are different than typical based pasteurization or something like that. So if there's any sort of uh, divergence from what's typical of large-scale food processing industry then it becomes very challenging to move from small scale to large scale. It's definitely true in the United States. Uh, sounds like it's a similar process in, in Europe. 
Thank you. Does anyone want to respond to that? Yeah, I think here in, in Europe, I, uh, I give the example of Belgium, uh, we have the problem that most of legislation is written for the big food industry. And that those same rules are applicable for small. And that pushes a lot of people to be too stressful to really start or to try out uh, stuff. I always have that discussion with starting companies. They are stressed like, yeah, but what with the food safety? How do we work, work about it? And what I learned uh, by doing it is they open to dialogue, but you have to be ready to take time and to, to be open uh, of that. We bettered our processes thanks to the, the controls because they were asking questions that we couldn't respond directly on it. And if you acknowledge that in the discussion, then it's possible on, on smaller scale, but it's true that it's scary uh, when you have a control for the first time and it's, it's not the right way I find to start within a food company to, to be always on, on the lookout about that. Uh, most people use common knowledge to, uh, to better it and it's, it's a learning process then for everybody. But now it's really don't do it uh, except if you super uh, far, uh, far into, into the process. Thank you. Does anyone want to respond to this? I do think that's a very interesting point and I think also for um, uh, bringing up the cost, of course, when you start an innovation, if you have to take into consideration all these possible legislations, but that can be something that is challenging. Uh, another topic that came back uh, to the fore. Oh, sorry. Can I, I just make a remark. Sure. I, I have the I have the impression that there is a positive correlation between the wealth of a country, GDP per capita, and the amount of legislation, which is really a luxury. Aspect also because if you're poor, there's no legislation. Yeah. No, that is true. That in a way that reminds me of what Tacitus said that in a state that is the most corrupt, there are the most laws. So there's all sorts of these sort of <laughs> correlations, I think. But then that's a slightly different topic. Uh, one one of the other topics that that came back and forth a little bit is also the role maybe of selling upscale products. Uh, to, to start and fund this innovation in the beginning, huh? like what Yannick, for instance, was saying about selling to uh, high-end restaurants, uh, making small batches maybe profitable in, in, in that way. And there might be other sorts of, of ways in which that can also play a role, of course, in, in forwarding this sort of innovation, or like what Seth suggested with uh, uh, making a whiskey instead of a beer, because you can sell a whiskey at a much higher price. Consumers are willing to pay a bit more if it's special. Uh, is there anyone who wants to comment on this? I see here. Adam? Yeah, in, interestingly enough, I mean, as you can imagine, as a company, we go through a lot of produce uh, that goes bad in the course of our testing. And so we actually uh, we actually do ferment and distill our, our produce. So I had a really, had a really lovely um, um, plantain room the other day. Um, I, I would just say that yeah, any time that you're starting a company and you're, you're trying to grow something up from the bottom, you're looking for as much cash as you can get through operations as fast as possible. And, and oftentimes scale is the limit. So I mean, it totally makes sense that the very first question you have, if you start tech side first, you know you're going to, you know, you're doing a particular type of technology or a particular type of approach. The question should be, where can I generate using this approach the most value for the most people? And in the early stage, it's not even necessarily the most people, it's the most value. Um, so yeah, the, the margin is the single most important variable uh, as you, when you don't have any capital. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would just like to add a point on that, on the fact that also uh, particularly for food, it's people who have uh, enough wealth are interested in testing food more than others are more curious about it. So on top of the fact that indeed the margin is, is the key, they are globally you see uh, more interested people anyway. So uh, that's even reinforced that effect. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that's also a very valuable point that people who have more to spend can also experiment a little bit more with new flavors and tastes. Um, so, on your comment about you know not having enough uh, funds to get going, I mean, in the, in the U.S., I have a number of uh, colleagues who work for startups that are backed by VC, and it feels like they can't give away enough money, um, you know, for really stupid ideas that don't even work in agriculture. So, is it fair to say that that's a choice that you've decided not to go that route, or is it have you actually had trouble getting VC funding for your type of area? Well, I, I, oh, I should probably wait for the thing. <laughs> Um, so, you know, we, we have been supported by a number of different institutional investors along the years. And um, I would say that VC money is the most expensive money, like far and away. Because what you don't see is, it's not, it's not a loan in the sense that you have an interest or a bond in the sense you, you pay a coupon. Like, what, what you're dealing with is the expectation that after 10 years, it's a 10x. And if you sort of back calculate that, they're looking at the interest rate. It's easily high, you know, 20 percent and 30 percent, right? So it's essentially some of the most expensive money that you can that you can get. Uh, I think if you're if you're VC back, it actually pushes the need for the margin into the stratosphere, right? Because you're you're already sort of fundamentally as a basis of your financials paying this interest, so your return on capital has to be super high. And the best way to get there is margin. You can also get there with velocity, so selling a lot in a very short amount of time. Um, but I think we're, we're sort of talking in sort of, in sort of physical product context, not so much an app thing. Um, so you really, it's the margin. In, in the egg space, it seems though like that uh, most of the VC companies I'm aware of are not so concerned about their product. Uh, they're more concerned about uh, having a, uh, uh, a threat to the bigger players who will buy them out, right? So, I mean, that's, that's another strategy in the egg space. That seems to be most of the strategy is We'll grow till you know Monsanto buys us out, and then mm -hmm. everybody gets a unicorn or a 10x payday, right? Yeah. Um, I I think. Um, <laughs> sorry, get your I just want to get in my exercise. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that um, that is definitely one strategy that folks have. I mean, you'll hear it for Silicon Valley types talk about um, they literally will build a company where the goal is to be kind of scary to Facebook, so Facebook buys you out of your debt, right? <laughs> um, so I think in ag there's a, a relatively um, there's a relative dearth of IPOs. So because there's a relative dearth of IPOs, many institutional investors may have more of a buyout strategy as opposed to others. But hopefully, you know, I, I think if this ag tech sector is growing very very quickly in terms of total funding. There have been a few IPOs in the last few years. That are that are kind of paving the way, and hopefully that kind of opens up a bit for the industry, um, and it becomes a little bit more about building businesses hopefully that are to last. Um, so yeah, it's it's very dynamic. It's a very interesting space. I'm I'm blunt and honest. So I'll just say your business model and what your your actually looks like a viable product, whereas most of those startups I don't think are ever going to have viable product. <laughs> so maybe that's why you're not going with VC. I don't know. <laughs> I appreciate. It. Uh, are there any other questions at this point? I do remember there was a question earlier from Christian. Um, yes, but this was more physiologically oriented question. I wanted to know that the mode of action. Oh, I'm not sure you were seeing that do in your fixation. Oh, of the cheating? Uh, yes, so Mark sent the, uh, I think it was in the chat. Okay. Well, what does it do? Is it blocking the, the reception or? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Usually we put silver. So, yeah, oh, exactly. Usually silver, right? So, so silver, silver one and copper one are iso uh, ions, and so copper one binds uh, the receptor protein um, that's part of the ethylene signaling pathway, and basically ethylene comes along and there's a copper ion sitting inside that protein. And the copper ion will bind ethylene, and there'll be a, you know, a change in configuration of the protein, and that brings about a signal, right? So what MCP does is because of the energetics of the double bond, it's able to bind the copper ion very strongly and doesn't come off, at least on the kinetics of the life cycle of the protein, basically. 
And so it precludes ethylene from being able to come in and bind, mm -hmm. uh, at least until the, the, the plant produces new ethylene receptors. Mm -hmm. Good. I have one question. Yeah, it's just a continuation of this. It's, uh, so MCP is quite known and well studied. So what makes your product specifically that unique or different from uh, using one MCP? Yeah, it's, so it's the kinetics of the application. Um, in, a, in a typical application case and for the conventional fumigation, those will last about 18 hours. And it's sort of designed to sort of let a bolus, basically on a bolus application. And we do a continuous application over a period of time. So the notion is that the kinetics of the application in our product kind of uh, parlay into improved efficacy for a broader view of different crops. So especially if you have a crop that has a really high protein turnover, um, the application of single bolus of MCP will not be very effective. But a continuous application is. So that's sort of the basis uh, is to hit a larger number of crops. Um, are there any final questions, maybe, for any of the speakers or any final remarks anyone wants to make? Uh, I don't think we have any further uh, questions in the uh, app at this moment or at the chat. So with that, I would like to thank uh, all of our speakers again as we are closing, uh, towards, drawing towards a close for this evening. Thank you all again for your contributions and thank you also to the audience for the interesting uh, discussion and participation. Uh, then as a final remark, I would like to point out that tomorrow uh, on February the 17th from two o'clock to four o'clock in the afternoon, we have another uh, BRIAS event. This event takes place online only, so only on uh, Microsoft Teams. And the workshop is entitled, What can we learn from the evolution of EU agricultural policy from debates on the farm to fork strategy? And with that, I would like to say goodbye to you all. In the uh, chat, we will post a number of links uh, towards our Bria social media. If you want to learn more about Bria's or want to follow us, please follow us there. And with that, I wish you all a good evening. Thank you.